a basic hive, you're going to have your queen and your workers, which are all female, and your drones, which are all male. And the drones only have one job, and that is to find the queen and mate with her. And everybody's like, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, he even gets fed. He gets doesn't have to do anything in the hive. He doesn't even have a stinger. Um, the queen goes out for mating flight, and the drones are, I call it the drone bar, <laughs> and they're all waiting for the queen. So the drones all come out to chase her and to mate with her. So the drone, since he doesn't have a stinger, has a penis. And when he mates with the queen and he's done, he falls backwards. And I've heard it's audible, I've never heard it. <laughs> but his penis actually snaps off and he dies. When I was right out of college and had my first house, uh, a friend of mine was renting a farmhouse and he said, do you want some bee equipment? It's in the back room. And I was like, sure. So I got the bee equipment and I didn't know what to do with it. So I called up a, a bee uh, company that sells equipment and sells bees and measured everything carefully and told them what I had. Apparently I had homemade boxes that wouldn't fit any of their equipment. So I actually just ended up ordering a whole hive and bees and everything like that. And I was terrified. I had a full, full on suit and gloves and veils and a smoker. And I had my equipment set up and I got my bees in the mail and I kind of like, just like threw them at the hive <laughs> and prayed for the best that they actually landed in there. Um, but I knew absolutely nothing and it took years because I didn't have very much guidance with it and uh, matter of fact I'm probably going to write a book on 101 ways to kill bees and how I've done each and every one. Uh, but then I started going to some courses. Young Harris in Georgia has some wonderful courses and our local bee club through some uh, kind of seminars on how to keep bees and I got very interested in the bees that I had so I decided I wanted more of them so I started with three hives when I first moved out here and being a member of the bee club with the extension service people would have swarms so I would go get swarms and stuff by the end of the first year I had about 10 hives and I built it up every year until I had about 65 hives which ended up being way too many to, for one person to to deal with. So I brought it down to about 45 and that's what I that was my average that I like to keep around 45 hives for for years and uh, the honey is so dependent on the weather. If we get a late freeze we lose all the blooms at the end of spring. It, we had that three years ago, four years ago and it's affected the poplar up to this year when we had a good bloom but then it rained for two weeks. So you're just absolutely dependent on the weather on how much honey that you're gonna get. Um, the weather and your bees. There have been years when I have taken at least four supers off of one hive for each flow. There are two flows, our early spring flow and our sarawood. So I mean up to eight supers off of one hive. And a super you can count on about nine to 10 quarts of honey in each one. There have been years like last year where I was lucky to get a super off of any hive. It's just, it's so dependent on what's going on. You just can't, you can't count on getting honey. 
but that's not the most important thing to me. The most important thing to me is that the bees are healthy. And honey, their extra honey for me is such a gift that I appreciate any that I can get. And if it's none, I'm good with that. Um, I just want the bees to be healthy. So the basic setup, um, I use a traditional, well, not fully traditional. Um, it was, it's actually a Langstrom hive. I believe it was the early 1900s that it was, that, and it's, it's the square boxes that you see. It's your basic home, home beekeeping box. There's a larger box on the bottom, and I use screen bottom boards under there. The floor is screened, so it lets ventilation in and lets dirt out. And then the larger box, which is called a brood box, and then smaller boxes that we put on top, kind of like the attic, and that is, we call those honey supers. And they've all got racks in them. The reason we don't have the big boxes as our honey supers is because when they're full of honey, they weigh about 80 to 85 pounds. And I don't want to carry that down in my truck. <laughs> the smaller boxes weigh, if they're really full, can weigh 45 pounds. So that's about all I want to deal with with that. Then we have a nice... Uh, inner cover that also lets ventilation through. It's got a hole in it and you can kind of lift the lid to see the bees without having to disturb them. And then a, a nice weather lid on top of that. So that's the basic equipment setup. I actually do not get into my bees every day. I know I've seen a lot of new beekeepers that have to get into their bees and look at their racks and do everything every day, but you kill so many bees every time you do that. They get squished or they um, you move a rack and it, it kills some brood, or you hold a rack up too long and the little tiny larvae kind of start to dry out in the sun and before you put... So I try not to unnecessarily get into my bees. If I have a hive that looks like very few bees are coming in and out, whereas yesterday there was a lot, I'll look in and see what's going on. One of my main triggers for a healthy hive when I'm looking in them is how the queen is laying. Even if I don't see the queen, I can see how many eggs are in there. I can see if there's new stuff, if there's how she's doing. And that kind of gives you the whole health of, of that hive. If you pull out racks and there's no eggs or there's all drone cells, you can kind of tell a problem um, by how she is laying. During this time of year, while there are things in bloom, like I said, she can lay up to 1,500 eggs a day, and she does. She just constant, that's all she does. She gets fed, she lays eggs all day, and at night they kind of cluster around her and the brood, keep it at a certain temperature. If it's cold outside, they keep it at, they keep it at 92. If it's cold outside, they actually unhinge their wings and make the same motion as flying, which creates heat, the vibration, so that and the inner, inner bees move out and the outer bees move in and they keep a constant 92 degrees. If it's really hot out, you'll see them all out front and they will actually fan to get a circulation of air going through the hive so it doesn't get too hot in there. You'll see them hanging outside sometimes about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. All of the new babies that haven't flown yet will come out and kind of hover around the front of the hive just to kind of learn to fly and to get their orient they orient by the sun and get their orientation and they're usually very light colored and very fuzzy and they look like little gems out there when the sun's hitting them it's it's a really neat thing and the the baby bees that are first born their first job is in the nursery they feed the babies they take care of everything because they've just hatched out of the nursery, so they're there. So their first job is in the nursery. And they move on to different things, sometimes collecting pollen from bees that are coming in and packing it in, or collecting nectar and packing it in. And then they eventually go out for their little first flight, and learn to fly, and pretty soon they're just out doing worker bee stuff. And I've heard, I, mean, I don't know about this, but I've heard that once the bees get older, if they make it, because a lot of them wear themselves out, wear themselves to death, um, those become the guard bees. So they've all got different roles and they move. They don't have one job. They grow into jobs.
So that's pretty much establishes your basic colony. The queen is nothing but laying eggs. The workers are feeding the babies, getting more food, doing their thing, and the drones are hanging out at the bar. <laughs> Swarms are actually the bee's original way of, of splitting. Um, as a beekeeper, I've manually split hives, and a lot of people do that. But we stole it from the bees. They actually split. When they're, when they're feeling like there are too many bees in there, or too many bees, like the queen has enough, or I don't know exactly all the things that triggers it, but the workers will make a new queen and they will pick brand new hatched larva and every time an egg hatches into a larva they each get a dose of royal jelly which most people have heard of and it's made that's made in a gland in the worker bees so when they pick one to be a queen they constantly feed her that royal jelly and it's very high in hormones very high in in nutrients it's just it's a power food. So she gets fed and she gets fed and she gets fed and pretty soon she's much larger, so much larger that her, it looks like a peanut, her cocoon when it's hanging off of the, off of the hive. And she hatches out and the new queen stays in the hive, takes care of business, goes out on a mating flight, comes back in. The old queen, meanwhile, gets about half the bees in there and says, come on, and they fly off. And th that's where you'll see like on the news, there's a bunch of bees on a park bench or in a tree, or something like that, and it's called a swarm. And what they're doing is they're all clustering around this queen and sending scouts out to find a good place to live. When they find a good place, it's like, come on, and everybody goes and they find a new home. Uh, a lot of beekeepers, if this happens, try to catch that swarm. And you need to do it before the scouts find another place. So there is a little bit of a rush to it. And put it into a new box. And once you get the bees and the queen in that box, you'll see all the bees fanning and they're putting out a pheromone. It smells a little bit like lemon pledge to me. And it, it says, the queen is here. We're home. We have a home. Come on. And they get to work immediately on it. They, I mean, they're already cleaning it out. They're making a home. First apartment. Well, I started about four years, four or five years ago, having some pretty large losses, like half my colonies at a time, and I would get a few more bees. I brought it down. This year I had to buy several hives of bees to get it up to 20. And that's where I've decided that I want to stay right now is at 20. Just I'm involved in other things and I want to be able to give them the most attention that I can. And 45 was too many. I wasn't able to give them that attention. So I've got it to 20. Um, a normal loss used to be about 10%. Right now, in the last few years, I've had around 50% loss, so it's, it's definitely getting harder and harder. Yeah. Colony collapse disorder, that is my, that's my bingo question at the market. <laughs> What's this colony collapse disorder? Um, my theory is that it is not a bee disorder, that it is a people disorder. And the reason that they call it a disorder is because it's not a disease, it's not a bacteria, it's not a fungus, it's not a specific thing. It's just generally a disorder and people don't, they can't pinpoint what it is, which is why they've given it this blanket term. Um, I think it's a people disorder because I think it has to do with so many different things that we are doing to our planet. Now I'm gonna get a soapbox here. 
<laughs> I think it's um, pesticides, especially the neonicotinoids. Um, I think it is global warming. Um, I'll expand on that in a second. I think it is pollution. I think it is so many things that, that, is go that are going on right now that are really affecting our bees. I think that they are a canary in a coal mine and that we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, the, the pesticides, even something as simple as seven dust, which is available to every home gardener and people use it prolifically, can be picked up as pollen when the bees are pollinating squash flowers or whatever. They bring it home, they eat it, they feed it to their babies, and pretty soon you have a very weak hive. When you have a weak hive, it's very hard to get it back to a strong hive, and you're probably going to lose it. I think that the weather is being huge. Um, our warmer winters here in the mountains, it used to stay cold all winter, warm up some in the spring, get hot in the summer. Kind of like you would think summer, fall, and winter and spring should be. <laughs> But uh, in, the, in the last, even since I've moved here, I've noticed more and more, we'll have a two or three week stretch in February where it's 60 degrees outside and the sun's shining and the bees go out and look for food and there's nothing blooming, there's nothing going on. And they go back in and they eat all of their stores of honey and they've worn themselves out looking for food. And they're supposed to last all winter long, kind of, resting and chilling out, but now they're worn out, they're eating all their food, and then you have a week where it's 10 degrees, and they don't have the energy to keep up with that, the changes, the, the huge swings. Um, and the warmer winters are leading to things blooming earlier, and then again, you'll get an April 10 degree freeze, so all the blooms get killed and the bees have nothing to eat in that early spring when it's so important. I think that the weather is really, you're like, well, it's warm other places. Well, yes, it's warm in Florida where people keep bees, but there are things blooming constantly down there. The terrain is very different than it is here. Here there just are not things blooming in the winter for the bees. Individuals can help a lot by not buying these products that kill our wildlife and kill our bees and kill our kill us just don't buy it research a little bit if you're getting plants at Lowe's now they're actually labeling plants that are um, have neonicotinoids on them or at least at Home Depot I'm not sure if it's Lowe's or Home Depot but one of them is doing that um, don't buy them don't buy Southern Dust. Don't buy Roundup. There are organic options for every single one of those. Well, one of the big things is take it easy on the weed eating in the spring. I know it, you want your yard to look really fine, but leave a few of those dandelions. You don't have to leave them all, but leave a few. Leave some of the clover. Um, leave some of the flowers that are pretty and, <laughs> and let the bees do that. Um, and you can probably plant about anything that flowers and the bees will, will really like it. They get on my onions, they get on my squash, they get, some of it is pollen, some of it is nectar, um, but they just need something pretty to do. And you end up with a pretty yard and happy bees. <laughs>
300 to 350 bucks and then another 100 to 200 for bees. So, but don't let that be a, don't let that trip you up because if you can find beekeepers, I have boxes over there that um, maybe the paints, I have plenty, I have plenty. <laughs> and I, people have brought me boxes and stuff like that. And I have always got a store of things for new beekeepers that I know can't really swing the budget for it. But if you can get the bees, you can find the equipment. Someone can help you out. And someone can probably help you out with bees.